Welcome back to this episode of the Law of Relevancy podcast. Today I'm joined by another leader in local journalism, Mark Gordon from the Business Observer. Mark, thank you for joining me. Hey, thanks for having me. It's good to be here. So I'm totally intrigued by your publication. Uh, we spoke to some other uh, leaders of another business magazine here in the Tampa Bay region. Your magazine focuses and your paper focuses on the region just south, that lower left-hand corner of Florida, right? Uh, plus, yeah, I mean, yes, correct. Plus Tampa as well. So um, we go um, Polk and Tampa south to Collier County. And, and that's a region that, uh, based off of my, you know, I moved to Tampa in, in, in Florida in early 2001. And historically, that's been a region that it seems like has been dramatically influenced by tourism. But it seems like there's a massive change happening. I, I think there is in, in, all, in all the regions we cover. I mean, I kind of break it down between... Tampa, St. Pete, Sarasota, Bradenton, and, and Fort Myers, uh, Naples. And, and I think all those markets are have traditionally relied on tourism. And that's obviously not going away. I mean, look at the latest numbers for uh, tourists coming to Florida. But um, I, I think you're seeing pockets, especially in the Tampa, St. Pete areas of tech stars and tech companies like, um, you know, Brian Murphy's ReliQuest that, you know, has a billion dollar valuation, the so-called unicorn. So I think that transition and transition has been happening for sure. But what I'm really excited about is, you know, a lot of a lot of people who live in Sarasota, who've retired in Sarasota, retired in Naples. Um, we're talking about massive amounts of wealth. Some of the most wealthy regions of the entire country are some of the population that live near the beaches on that west side of 41, the highway, the Tamiami Highway that goes down. Sure, and it seems like. A lot of these people have retired earlier or they still want to be relevant and they're looking for ways to get dialed back in, whether it's tech startups, venture capital. There's some very exciting companies companies getting started here in this region that you serve, as well as uh, companies who are moving to that region. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely, you're right. I think uh, there's a lot of examples like that of, of uh, retired people or semi-retired coming to this region. And they get on these, not necessarily boards, but um, investor groups. There's a company or an entity in Sarasota, the Bridge Group, and it's retired Johnson & Johnson and retired other executives that sort of fund and start up some of their own companies. And so tell me a little bit more about what you do. So you're the managing editor of the Business Observer. The publication that you run Obviously, it touches that region, but what does it look like? What is a day in the life of a managing editor of a publication that focuses on business like you do look like? Sure. So, you know, some of the job a day in the life is, is keeping the trains running on time. Um, but we, we have a weekly print publication that uh, we publish every Friday. Um, and so part of my job is geared towards, you know, I know that on that Friday, I'm going to have a 24 page paper that we need to fill. And I have a Uh, I work with a team of reporters, three others that uh, we work together and I write some stories as well and um, photographers. And so part of the week is geared up toward um, getting that publication ready to print. And then a day in the life is we're really geared toward news, news, news. And that's been one of the big goals that we've had in 2022 is to be more uh, timely, more fresh, especially with our websites and updating and constantly delivering uh, more news. So a day in the life is what what kind of business news stories are we tracking each day? And so there's a cr- incredible amount of parallels between what happens in a social media feed, especially a news organization like yourself, and a print publication, even with a, f- a frequency of like a weekly one. If you end up with a breaking story or something that's news, how do you determine whether or not something goes in a social media feed or waits for the publication or goes in both? It's it's a really hard question and we deal with it every, I mean, I was um, 45 minutes before this call, I was talking to our Tampa, uh, our commercial real estate editor in Tampa and and we are, he's been putting together a story um, uh, that's some breaking news in the Sarasota market and we're kind of figuring out where does this go? Is this right away on social media? Is this wait for print? Um, 
we're probably going to end up doing digital first. That's been a big mission of ours is to be much more digital, much more social media, and then use the print as sort of um, a wrap up or kind of here's what happened during the week. Um, but it's a constant conversation we have is with, with my team is where does this fit? What are we delivering to readers? Do they need to know this now and where are they going to get this information? One of the things I really like about a newspaper per se is just like this podcast, in many ways, you can dig deeper into a story. You know, the resolution on a piece of paper is still better than a, than a screen, right? And so you can pack a lot more in there. And there's just something charming and magical about looking at it. There's something truthful about seeing it in print. Absolutely. Tell us a little bit about your background in journalism. Like, how did you get to become the CEO? I mean, sorry, the managing editor of, of The Observer. Yeah, so I, um, I went to school in Pittsburgh, um, University of Pittsburgh, and I um, kind of floated through a year or so, didn't really know what I wanted to do, and um, ended up, um, uh, I liked this young girl who worked for the student newspaper there, and um, went there and, and became a reporter, and um, I really loved it, found my passion, and um, after college, I worked for some newspapers um, in Philadelphia and New York, and um, at a lot of newspapers, especially small newspapers, you start um, covering cops and courts and writing accident stories. And um, it's kind of where you, you learn the most, I think. Um, I did that. And um, in 2005, I moved to Sarasota, much, a few years after you moved to Florida, and um, joined the Observer Media Group and um, kind of worked my way up from there. Well, that's, that's cool. And, and I've, there's been a lot of changes in media and in your region during that time. What are some of the ways, I mean, your tenure at that publication is impressive to be in at one publication like that for that period of time, especially during a time where there's been consolidation, there's been disruptions in the media channels. Tell us a little bit about how you guys have dealt with that adversity and adjusted to stay relevant. Yeah, it's a good question. So uh, we started our, you know, like everybody, like, like so many other publications, I guess this is about a decade ago, uh, a daily email blast. And, and I think that's, that was the first way for us to stay relevant. Um, and, and I think we kind of cliche rested on our laurels a little bit too much with that. Um, I think, uh, you and I were talking right, right before the show about, um, that we were casually late to the party. I think there's a lot of other publications, uh, that, that jumped quicker to digital than we did. Um, we had, like I said, we had this daily email blast, but we didn't um, enhance it or expand off it. And that's something that we've really worked very hard um, the last six months on. Dig digital first is something I say almost every day um, to get our team, to get myself remembering that this is the way the industry is going and, and we need to stay on top of that. So um, I think your question was about, you know, how, how have we done it? Um, it's just constant remembering that it, it, this is, this is the direction that we want to go and sort of practicing what you preach. During that time period, there's been crazy disruptions in your revenue model as a publication. The money from digital isn't, I mean, from what I understand, it's not nearly yeah. as much as of what you used to be able to do with print. Right. How, how are you guys staying streamlined? I mean, you have a full-time staff of, of three others correct so a total of four of mm -hmm. you guys and then you have a, about eight freelance writers that you work with to focus on different areas how do you through the digital means i mean it's obvious that you're passionate about journalism uh and how do you take that passion but still run a a, a publication like what you do even when these challenging times where the revenue just I mean, it, tomorrow there could be a new way, you know, or just new disruption. Yeah, it's, you know, again, we talk about that too. Um, uh, you know, where, where are some publications going, right? We're, we're shifting more toward a membership type model mm -hmm. where we're not overly reliant on one um, advertising revenue stream, because as you pointed out, that's certainly changed a lot. And the way that sort of Google publishing and, and, and Facebook and, and, and how that's all changed, you can't really rely on that. And, um, the Business Observer has, for uh, since it started, essentially uh, 1997, we've relied also on legal advertising, and that's a um, industry that's also changed as well due to regulations. So, to answer your question, um, uh, we're looking to sort of be 
more reliant on our members and our readers for revenue than right. we are for advertising. I think that's a, a long, well, I know it's a longer term goal for the entire company. Well, that's it potentially even a healthier organization in terms of, uh, I know that, for example, the incentive structure for journalism has shifted, you know, over the years. In the past, when it was purely advertising driven, um, there were certain ways that journalism and articles were written. When we got into the zone of where uh, actual journalists and writers were being compensated for selling subscriptions, you have a whole different other kind of approach or disposition to how those articles are being fr- like uh, positioned or how salacious or clickbaity right. an article could, could be. Exactly. What's going to happen when you shift into a membership? I, I would assume it's going to get back to the older model more because you're more tailoring to your audience. I, I think so. And, and I hope so. And, and I think the one thing I hope that as a, as an industry we stay away from is, um, you know, you mentioned, you know, what it started as, and, and, and I've thought this before, if you think about newspapers in, in the eighties and nineties, where um, if you read a Sunday newspaper, it was this really thick, you know, two phone book type publication that like slammed on your driveway And it was full of ads for car dealers and furniture stores and home builders. And and I think newspapers kind of, frankly, gave the finger to their customers and basically said, this is the only way you can advertise. So you're going to have to advertise with us. And and then obviously Craigslist and Angie's List and and Google and all these things changed that. And newspapers, well, what do we do now? So I, I, to your point, I hope that when the sort of shift continues, um, it's, it's the content that matters, and we go back to this position of not, not clickbait, but maybe writing a combination of quick hit breaking news, but also that long-form journalism that I think you and I like to read, and um, I, I hope, I think others, or I think our readers like to read that as well. Yeah, and it seems like you'll actually have more of a direct relationship with your true customer, which is the reader. Right. Absolutely. I think that can only be good. So... Let's talk a little bit about your region. So because of your position, because of your publication, you are probably one of the most de facto experts on what's happening in the south of Tampa Bay, all the way down to Naples, you know, over towards the middle of the state region. What are some of the transformations that you've seen happen over the last few years? And where do you think it's going? Uh, I, I think the the biggest thing, um, certainly this is part of this is, is sort of pandemic related, but a little bit before as well, but it's um, especially Tampa and St. Pete getting a little bit younger, definitely more tech centric, more um, younger millennial type people that are that are moving here, not just sort of to take care of an uh, elderly relative, but to come here and work here. Um, so I, I think that's the direction it's going. And I think that's going to require a lot more housing. I think that's an issue that I'm sure it's, I know it's come up in your previous um, rele- relevancy podcast is affordable housing is certainly an issue that that's not going away. Um, just as an aside, Sarasota, um, I, I read today that, um, you know, they're looking into uh, the county's looking into affordable housing options that aren't going to come online until 2026. And, and I feel like that's like too far away. I think there are people in need of that, uh, you know, lower um, more affordable housing today. Uh, but I think that's a trend. You're going to see a lot more young people moving here, a lot more tech companies. Um, Sarasota had two companies in the past week announce uh, $20 million venture, ca- venture yeah. capital funding, which um, being here 16 years, I-, I never heard of that in Sarasota or Bradenton. I'm, I'm sure it happened in a more private scale, um, but two in, 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 in a recent period of time is pretty unusual. So um, I think that's the biggest transformation is is more technology companies, more sort of disruptors, um, bringing a younger demographic here. It, and, you know, anybody who's driven on I-4, south on 75, 275, if you just pay attention to the sides of the highway, it seems like we're starting to see distribution centers pop up all over the place. I mean, there's these massive, massive buildings that look like hundreds of thousands of square feet. It, it's, it's wild, isn't it? My, my wife and I actually drove from Sarasota to Orlando on Saturday. We went to see Garth Brooks in Orlando and um, our son's a little bit older now. So we, we haven't been a Legoland or 
or Disney in a couple of years. And that's the, what we kept talking about. Look at that. That wasn't here a year and a half ago. So these, ha- these warehouses are ginormous. I mean, um, uh, Amazon is certainly, if they're not already one of the biggest employers or the biggest employer in Florida. So yeah, that's uh, an interesting trend for sure. Um, when one of the areas is not too far from where you live, like for example, um, this weekend, I'm going to be spending time at the, uh, the big rowing facility right there off the highway. Mm-hmm. My son does uh, rowing for his high school and it's an unbelievable world-class facility that's been created there. Well, do you remember the name of the park? I'm, I'm escaping me right now. Yes, Nathan Benderson. Nathan park. Benderson Park. It's absolutely amazing. If you like to do regattas or watch them or rowing, it's it's probably the premier facility, maybe in the country for that, including the Northeast. It's unbelievable. It's literally it, custom. It's gorgeous, and and they put a lot of time and, and money in it. There was a, I wrote a story about it. This is about ten years ago. Uh, somebody who worked for uh, Benderson Development. It was at the time Nathan Benderson was the sort of patriarch and and this individual went around the world to other rowing facilities and basically with the mission to be better than the best rowing facility he found so he was he went to japan he went to australia um he went to a couple places in europe and um the result is what you said and and rowers love it um a little off your question but i always thought that was a, a neat story yeah well that whole area is is amazing just the development i mean it probably wasn't too long ago when that was all groves and farmland. It was probably beef being raised out there. And now you've got the University Town Center Mall area, which yep. during COVID, it was obviously pretty empty. But now it's coming back so strong just to get through those intersections. You know, you might be going a mile. It takes like 10, 15 yeah. minutes. It, it is. I'll tell you, it, and we I actually live a mile and a half from there. And, and I walk. Uh, Benderson Park is 3.4 miles. I, I walk it, try and walk it three days a, a week with a with a friend of mine. Um, but you know, you mentioned your son being here. I, I I think it's fun on those big weekends when you go to Publix or the UTC Mall or you're out at a restaurant. You see all these uh, you know college rowing teams and high school rowing teams. It's kind of a neat indicator of how cool this park is and and this um, you know environment we live in. Yeah, and it's not just. That park, but what's unique about it is you think Sarasota, you think the beaches, you think the botanical right. gardens, you think about all of that tourism that's over to the west. And here you've got this true diversification of facility that is literally right up next to the the highway, which is obviously wonderful frontage, but it is world class in terms of uh, just the community, like the park that's there. And it's really great to see how sarasota and that whole corridor is growing in lots of different ways not just yeah. in the obvious historical way and and i'm encouraged because you know just being someone who's lived here in florida since 2001 we're not a one-trick pony anymore yeah so important yeah i mean there's there's manufacturing there's distribution there's medical there's uh so many like those 20 million dollar investment funds you're talking or the the, yeah. the actual investment that you talked about that you wrote about that was i believe a cybersecurity company or a, yeah and and that's something our region is becoming known for blockchain yeah. cybersecurity it's wonderful to see because those are top tier jobs and it's creating a need for housing like you're talking about yeah which is a good kind of one of those good problems, I guess. I mean, you mentioned you have a son. If you have other children, we certainly, you know, as parents, we want to have a, a place where our children can come back and, and, and work here and not have to move to some of those bigger cities. Sure. And, and it is a great place to live and work and call home here in the area. Are there any areas that are growing that you that just caught you by surprise? Any stories you've been following or trends you're seeing in the region? Um, you know, yeah, caught me by surprise. I, I don't know the region as well as I do Sarasota because this is where I live and, and work more here. But um, we started covering Lakeland probably about five or six years ago, six years ago, 20, 2015, seven years ago, um, because it was so connected to Tampa and. Um, I haven't finished writing it, but there's a, a census report that came out that has Polk County as I think the fourth largest or fastest growing county in the country, not just in Florida, but in the country. That was somewhat surprising to that me. Um, 
Uh, but, um, you know, so I think that's Lakeland is, is sort of growing. In, and I wonder if that has to do, again, you go back to affordable housing. And this is just speculation. I don't, I don't know this. But, you know, are people finding it a little bit more affordable than maybe Tampa um, or some of the communities there? Um, I know that's certainly the case in, in Pasco County, which is why Pasco is booming, because land is cheaper and home builders are able to put more homes into smaller plots of land and um, be able to sell homes a little bit cheaper. So um, Pasco is not as surprising. I think people have been predicting that for a while, but Lakeland super fast growth, I think has been surprising. Yeah. And, and when you, when you look at Lakeland, having been here, not a lot, I mean, I don't typically drive to Lakeland, but I might in the future because yeah. I mean, you just look at, there's a brand new park there, Bonnet Springs park. That is going to, it's right. an absolutely beautiful attraction that might actually pull people there. You have to, practically drive through Lakeland to get to Orlando. There's lots to do yep. in Orlando. Same yep. thing for people coming from Orlando. It's a great destination. And there's some unbelievably successful companies that have come out of Lakeland. You've got Publix. Yes. You've got Lazy Days, an enormous, enormous group right there, not far from Lakeland. Mm -hmm. And there is an incredible amount of talent, and it's actually quite beautiful. Um, yes, yes. I mean, even uh, even one of the things that that I really like seeing and was a huge surprise to me when I came to the area is that I, I believe it's Frank Lloyd Wright. Yeah, that's right. So go ahead. No, I was gonna say at Southern College. Yeah, there's a lot of architecture there. Sorry to. Yeah, that's that's pretty cool. Yeah. So I mean, if you've never, if you've if being someone who lives in in our regions, I mean, I think practically we're in the same region, but Frank Lloyd Wright is one of the most famous, if not the most famous American architect of all time. And the most concentrated collection of his buildings are right there in Lakeland. Yeah. And they are just as stunning today as, as uh, I'm sure they were when they were built. Yeah, that's pretty neat. I haven't been there either, but I, I have heard that. Well, Mark, let's get back to the business of running a publication. So there are parallels between a newspaper and the established cadence of publishing a weekly periodical. Then you have um, today's world of social media. Where are those areas where you feel like what you do has enhanced what we're seeing today on social media? I think the, the, the big, the, best example of that is when we do and we try and do this in, in a lot of stories sometimes it shines clearer than in others is how to or advice based stories um you know we talked to a certain business owner who figured out a new mousetrap for something somebody who um you know developed a software product and and this is how they use it um or on the flip side management advice leadership advice um you know how to have difficult conversations with employees um, you know, how to have a better or improve your company culture. That's something that I think resonates really well. We find that those do really well on social media um, that I think people sort of crave that information. How can I be better at my job, um, better as a leader, better running this business? I think one of the, one of the things I talk about, our team talks about a lot is um, uh, inform and inspire. That's kind of what I look at as the business observer. We want to be news and we want to inform people on what's going on, but we also want to um, inspire people like yourself to say, Hey, I never thought of that. Or now I'm going to try that with, with, with my team. So those, those do really well. Um, that's kind of a good intersection for us on, on social media. Yeah. And I think, I think one of the other ways that you guys really enhance is being an actual publication that has to go to print and has the editorial standards that you have you're bringing a lot of credibility to, to social media, right? You're worth paying attention to because your stories are actually vetted. It, it definitely helps. I think that's, you know, we're, we're, we've always been print first. Again, something you and I talked a little bit about earlier. Um, you know, we're, we're in Florida, on the West Coast of Florida. The demographics skew a little bit older. We're not hiding from that. Um, but we also know that to continue you know, 10, 15 years from now, we need to have a younger audience as well. So we're trying to balance the credibility that we have as a print product with doing more digitally and offering more digitally. 
Um, I, I think there's a way to do both. And that's kind of, that is what we're aiming for. Are there any changes that you feel like are coming your way that you guys are strategically having to position yourself for now? Yeah. Um, I, I, I think uh, changes, you know, I think there's going to be a time where we're not even going to, we just talked a little bit about it. We're not going to have a print edition. Um, and, and I mentioned this a little bit before 2022 for the business observer has been a very big year for digital first and for doing much more breaking news online and for not saying, Hey, we have this, we're just going to hold it until the print. We're going to be much quicker and still responsible about it, not clickbaity, but still put it online. And I think the transition to going away from print, I, I don't think it's necessarily this year. Um, but if you asked me that last year, I would have said, Oh, that's like 10 years away. I, I, I don't think it's 10 years in a way anymore. Um, I think it's closer than we think. So I think we are, working to sort of be in front of that transition. Um, I mean, certainly other publications have, you know, we're a weekly, so our print costs are different, but you know, look, you look at the Tampa Bay times, they've decreased their, their print um, products significantly, you know, as have many other print publications. So I think that's a, a change in the industry that we are geared up for. Would you guys ever see yourself moving into more of a, a, other channels too, that are in, uh, enabled through, the digital access we have today, like video? I think so. Um, we, we, I said before we were late to the party, I think we were early. We, we had a, a, actually a web editor um, probably about eight or nine years ago. And, and uh, she came to, she went with the reporters on interviews and did kind of like a separate interview with the CEO or the executive just for a YouTube channel. And, and I think we thought, Hey, this is going to be really cool. We didn't, we didn't have a champion, but I mean, we had that position, but we didn't do enough to promote it. We didn't do enough to say, Hey, you should come look at this. And then when it didn't go anywhere, we just kind of kicked it to the curb. Um, so I could certainly see us going back to that. I think there's a, um, there's an opportunity for us in the market to do more with video. Um, I, I don't have it in front of me, but, um, I have a goals uh, sheet every year, like so many of us and, uh, do podcasts often, is the first in my annual goals. And, and I have not done one yet. I'm on your awesome podcast, but I've not done my own. Um, uh, so it's, it's something that we think about. Um, and, and again, like so many organizations, we need a champion. We need somebody to, to sort of come in and say, we're going to do this. It's going to, it's going to kick butt and here's how we're going to do it. And here's how we're going to promote it. And um, so yes, to your question, I, I do see us doing more digitally. Yeah, for sure. And, and I think, I think one of the areas where, like you mentioned, a podcast can really be powerful, especially from a content creation standpoint, is that it's really difficult, probably not for somebody like you who's a journalist. You can probably easily sit down and start writing, but there's a lot of content out there in the world that needs to get like produced, right? And yeah. it's much easier to sit down after some practice and talk to a microphone and sit in front of a camera to create that content. And then you can always transcribe it later and, uh, and then it edit it, you know, to turn it into something that like getting those words out, getting that expertise out is, can be way more efficient using a video platform and a podcast platform. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I think I'm curious if you experienced this, um, uh, but the thing I think that's held me back the most in doing a podcast is sort of, fear of it not being good enough. Like I, I think I interview, we have the opportunity, this window into somebody else's life that I think is, is, is really cool. Like I'm meeting in two weeks in Sarasota, a former WWE wrestler who opened up a cookie store, which just sounds so funny to me. I don't know why I think that's funny, but, um, it's not the most masculine. Well, you think masculine, you think construction, right. you think, you know, beating things and, you know, muscles yeah. and all that. You don't think batter and butter. Right. He's got this cookie store. And I'm like, well, that'd be really, that's a, you know, the PR person pitched it and I jumped right away because I like cookies too. But, um, and I'm thinking, well, that'd be like a really cool interview. That'd be fun to do on a podcast. And then, but I look at all these cool, amazing podcasts out there and, you know, we're not going to do a crime serial. That's not a, a us. Um, and we're certainly, you know, not going to compete in that that sort of space. But I do think we have something to offer. I think we, we interview these interesting people and write about them. Um, but that's been, I think, my 
hold up or my my fear is is it is it going to be good enough um and and you know you want your quality to be be high level in everything you do yeah well uh it it, it is an interesting story the uh, the interview you're talking about doing i had uh the freaky scary experience of our very first episode of this podcast which was geez over two years ago now was the director of communications for Microsoft. <laughs> You're like going in, oh boy, what did I just get into? Exactly. So here yeah. I am. I'm literally doing this for the first time with, you know, minimal media training. And, mm -hmm. uh, and here I am talking to someone who's responsible for doing media training for people like Bill Gates. Yeah. Right. And so I'm completely out of my league. Right. And so mm -hmm. if, if I could give you some advice, it would be, you have to start it. You just have to do it. And your podcast is not going to be any good for about 20 episodes. Right. And maybe this one isn't any good either right now. Right. And I think we're about 70 or 80 episodes in, but you guys are plenty good. I, I watched some in prep. You guys are, are, are very, <laughs> very good. Thank you, Mark. But, uh, but anyhow, you start to get the hang of it, you know, and it's, and it, doing journalism is something I could never do, but I'm a curious person and I can, mm -hmm. I, I can listen. And that's what I try to do with guests. And, uh, and we are good at video production here. And yeah. so we, we try to create, we use our strengths to facilitate this. And the purpose of this podcast is literally to scale goodwill and good stories, mm -hmm. right? To educate. Well, yeah. And you hit it on the head, right? I mean, that's, I, I say that to reporters all the time, be curious, not cynical. I, I think in journalism, in our business, it's very easy to be cynical. It's it's very easy to roll your eyes. Like I even, even the, uh, the whole Will Smith, Chris Rock fiasco, you know, from the Oscars a couple of nights ago, my immediate thought was to be cynical and think that it was staged <laughs> because they wanted, uh, you know, drum up interest. I, I, having seen it now, I don't think it was, but... Um, but I think just constantly be curious about how other people do what they do and, and why they do it. Well, so speaking along those lines, you are true blue. You are a, a longtime journalist. Uh, you've, you've, it's been your career for quite a while. What advice do you have for students who are in journalism stu school now who people who are passionate about telling stories, like what advice can you give to the young people who are looking at journalism as a career? Yeah, you know, it's a good question. And I think you touched on it with the podcast answer. It's just do it. Um, find, find, if you, if you want to tell stories, find places to tell those stories um, and, and write and just get used to being a reporter, which includes a lot of rejections um, at, at any, at any level. I'm sure that's true in a lot of industries, but, at any level of journalism, no matter how long you've been doing it, you're going to be told no. You're going to be told, I don't want that in the press. Um, so I think the best advice I have for young journalists is to just find publications um, that will allow you and, and or pay you and, and, and write for them. I think that's how you learn. Um, I wrote, um, I did internships for newspapers where I wrote obituaries, which are really good experience to um, interview people and to get people to sort of open up and talk about a subject, about a person. Um, and like I said, I wrote about police news a lot, which is a ton of just hustling around and, and chasing the story. And I think that's the best way to learn is to just to just do it and, and write and, and find a job that will constantly give you those opportunities to, to write stories and, and interview people. So just start doing it. Yeah. And you'll find your way. All right, so now I'm going to flip the tables on you. You are obviously someone who has a lot of control over the business publication, a publication that can do a lot to highlight businesses in your region. What advice do you have to businesses that want to get coverage in a publication like yourself? Yeah, I think two, two things stand out. One would be to, to know the publication. Um, so read us, read us online, find a couple of stories that we've written about, um, you know, advice or, commercial real estate industry specific stories. So, so, and that'd be true for, for any publication, um, you know, the Tampa Bay business journal, um, Tampa Bay wealth, the Tampa times, um, Sarasota Hell Tribune, 
you know, all these publications have niches or have um, sort of target audiences. So the first advice would be to find uh, where you think your story fits the best. Um, and, and then I guess I said too, there'll be three things. The second thing is um, access. Um, if you're going to send materials to a reporter because you want to be covered, put a cell phone number, cell phone number in there and then be available. Um, uh, it doesn't mean you have to pick up the second the reporter calls, but it, it's happened significant amount of times in my career where I get press releases or something pitched to me and then I go to call that person and that person's not there or that number's not good or um, some combination of, um, well, why don't you just use what's in the press release? So I think uh, access, be available to a reporter would be the second thing. Um, uh, and, and, and then the third thing is, is um, try and find that thing that really makes you unique. Um, you know, I, I think one of the back and forth I have a lot with PR people or companies pitching stories, especially in Sarasota is, uh, wealth management um, companies. And you and I talked about this before, about the pockets of wealth have really deepened and increased and gotten bigger in Sarasota and Naples, especially even in the last year, but certainly the last five years. And there's a significant, there's like a ton of firms coming here to manage their wealth and to target high net worth investors. And we get pitched a lot. Can you write about my company because we manage other people's money? And I'll say, well, it, you need to be more unique than that. There has to be a hook. There has to be an angle. It's true. I mean, that's kind of um, uh, the pitches we get. So that's the third thing would be, um, you know, really find something about your company that stands out. Um, I'll, I'll just give you another example because um, I just got the press release today uh, from a hospital in Sarasota who hired a new chief medical officer, um, which is kind of a pretty standard news item but in there it said that this particular individual um is like a world champion skydiver um and apparently she still is doing it and i was like well i wrote her back right away saying well we certainly want to interview this person not that being a chief medical officer is not an important job it is uh but that's a hook that we can really um go deeper into so look for those unique angles yeah i mean in that particular one she's probably an expert at managing risk Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, that's good to know, Mark. Well, we really appreciate you joining us today and learning more about what you're doing there at the observer. And, uh, we're excited to share this podcast and, and help highlight the region, a region that's growing so incredibly fast. Where can people follow you? Where can they read the observer? Let us know where uh, we can find you online. Yeah, I mean, it's been it really uh, enjoyed being here. Um, but businessobserverfl.com is our website. So business and then observer spelled out and then FL for Florida, businessobserverfl.com. And as soon as you get on that site, you can, on the upper right-hand side, you can click on it and join our mailing or our, our um, email list and get our daily email blast, which comes out at 5 a.m. every day. Well, thank you, Mark. We'll definitely do that, and we'll follow you there. And all of you can follow this podcast and subscribe to it anywhere where podcasts are found. You can follow us on the Law of Relevancy social medias as well as bakemorepies.com social medias. Thank you again for joining us, and Mark, we'll see you later. Hope to see you again soon. Great. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Mark.